One of the technologies that we've developed and used over the last 25 years is radio telemetry. Basically being able to put a radio collar on an animal and then being able to follow it around. We're going to talk a little bit about today about how we use that in quail management. It's been quite significant in quail management. I like to recognize two eras, two time frames in what we know or what we thought we knew about quail. I call that the BT era, the before telemetry, and the AT era, the after telemetry. Telemetry came online for quail uh, roughly in the late 80s, early 90s kind of time frame. Prior to that time, Coffee Shop Talk would tell you that a quail, rooster and hen, or Aussie and Harriet, they're monogamous. They only raise one brood per year. That and a lot of other things have been dispelled as we were able to basically uh, tune in or spy, if you will, on quail. So today we have uh, Brad Kubechka. Brad is a graduate student here at the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch. He's uh, been involved with us for the last three or four years and is quite uh, learned in radio telemetry. And so we're going to learn a little bit about what radio telemetry is and how it can help us. So Brad, uh, this, this whole idea of radio telemetry, what can we learn about it relative to a quail and quail biology and the life of a quail? What are some of the things that we learn by the use of radio telemetry? I think the two most important things that we can learn about um, quail biology from radio telemetry is survival and reproductive output. Um, essentially being able to track that bird every day, knowing where it's at, um, what it's nesting in, uh, how they're surviving, it, it tells us a lot about the bird. Okay, uh, one of the things in about the survival is once we put the radios on there, about, if we had 100 quail, say, starting May the 1st, how many of those quail do we think are going to survive maybe till the next May? Is it going to be 50% of them or what? Uh, not according to our radio telemetry studies. Most um, radio telemetry suggests about 20-25% is what we're expecting from one, uh, one year survival, annual survival. Okay. And talking about the nesting, and boy, you know, if you've, if you've spent much time afield, maybe in your life as a quail hunter or somebody piddling around out in quail habitat, you might have discovered one or two nests. Tell us about the value of radio telemetry for studying nesting ecology. Once you've narrowed down that a bird has been in the same area for a couple days, we can deduce that that bird's probably nesting. Being able to monitor that, um, we get to see what they're nesting in um, as opposed to availability of nest sites. So we, we get to really see their selection process. Um, we can also look at, at clutch size, hatchability of, of, of eggs, and all, all kinds of neat stuff. We can also monitor the brood. Once that hen or cock that's incubating that nest moves off with, with a successful uh, clutch, uh, we, we can monitor that brood and then we can flush the brood a, a couple weeks later to look at brood survival and now, how those chicks are doing. Now, wait a minute. You said that the cock is going to brood the, the chicks or incubate the nest sometimes. So, so quail, a, a, a rooster is not a deadbeat dad? Right. Not always. According to our research here at the Rolling Plains Quality Research Ranch, about 10% of the time a cock will incubate the nest. However, um, Anecdotally, their survival is a little less, and usually the clutch size of the nest that they're incubating is a little smaller. What kind of threats does nesting pose to a quail? I mean, to the adult quail. I, I always say that raising a family is hazardous to your health. Does that apply to a quail also? Most definitely. Uh, well, average nest success here on the research ranch would say lingers around 45%. And uh, the the incubating bird might not always die if the nest is depredated. However, um, they definitely have that, that chance of, of lower survival being that they're sitting in one, in one spot for at least 23 days, the incubation period of a Bob White. So uh, they're sitting ducks, or sitting quail rather. <laughs> As you study the fate of these radio collared quail, and again, we've talked earlier in another webisode about how important predation and predation management is in the role of quail. Once you you find, and I know these radios basically have a live mode and they have a mortality mode, so maybe distinguish what those two are and then how does that help us? Right, so a live signal gives a beat about every second and a dead signal gives a beat about every half second, so it's a lot faster to beat. Um, they go on to dead signal about every 12 to 16 hours, so within 12 to 16 hours of that, that individual dying, we can find where, uh, where it was killed and use the evidence at the kill site to maybe um, try to figure out what killed it. So you can get to do a little CSI quail out here on the back 40 then? Yeah, pretty much. And what do you look for? Uh, so 
some things that I look for when I find a kill site is uh, what does the collar look like? Are there teeth marks on the collar? Was it a mammalian threat? Um, sometimes we find the collar actually in a snake, and that's kind of a dead giveaway. Uh, when a raptor will grab a collar, sometimes they'll, they'll curl that antenna, so sometimes it looks like a curly cue. Other things I look at are the feathers. If there's matting on the feathers that look like it's been in a, a mouth to add saliva, it's a mammal. However, if they're plucked clean, if they're straight cut, cuts, I like to think it was a, a bird of prey. Brad, based on what we found out here following these radio marked birds, uh, what are the major sources of mortality? Well, depending on the season, um, during our raptor migration in November or February, we'll have a lot of kills attributed to raptors or birds of prey. However, during the rest part of the year, especially during the summer when birds are sitting on the nest, it's most likely that they're going to be killed by a mammal when the, the raptors aren't around, maybe just the resident birds are hanging out. Well, Brad, we talked about survival, we've talked about reproduction and being able to follow them, but what else can we learn from following these radio marked birds? Well, movements is, is key, especially in some of our translocation um, work. We get to look at the dispersal of our birds from their release sites. Um, are they sticking on the, um, the property where we released them? Are they surviving? What kind of habitat are they selecting for? Um, various things like that, and then we, we can adjust our management, adapt um, to what those findings show. What would you say two or three revelations that we've seen over the last 20 years in the, in the AT era? Are there several, are there some revelations that have, have come out of the fact that we're being able to follow these birds more closely? I believe one thing is that we've noticed that they'll move a lot farther than we once expected. Um, but uh, other than that, there's, we've, we've learned that they're not completely monogamous. Um, a lot of little things that w once were completely thought to be opposite of what we know now. And, and going to that uh, the idea that, you know, I've always heard that, that they either quail will double clutch, they'll raise two broods, or well, they're not really raising two broods. It's just a late brood from a nest that was broke up earlier. Are they actually double brooding? Are we seeing two or more broods from the same hen? Yes, the same hen can have two successful clutches. It's, it's quite rare for a hen to have three successful clutches. Um, when that happens, usually she'll lay the clutch. Either her or the cock will incubate while she goes off to re-nest. If she does hatch those out, she might give them to the, the cock or another group of individuals. Quail are a socially dynamic kind of species, so they'll kidnap, they'll adopt, they'll do all those things um, so they can reproduce as much as they can. Sounds to me like you've been watching too much of today's uh, political news and soap operas. I like the Bob White of old, but yeah, certainly we've learned some things about them. Well, Brad, this is pretty fascinating technology. Is it, is it something that's available to us, to the everyday quail hunter or student of quail? It's available to anybody. However, I would say that it's not quite practical or, or inexpensive for the, the average Joe. Um, from a college kid standpoint, I wouldn't be able to afford many. Um, they cost about $200 brand new, and you have to think, we can't just put out 10 or 20. We're usually deploying 100 to 200 collars at a time. Uh, you can get them cheaper if you do refurbish the collar. They, they end up being about $150 at that what, point. What, what do you mean refurbish the collar? What does that consist of? Well, what we can do is we can, if we trap the quail um, later in the season or if we catch it um, by either night lighting or flushing and, and, and netting, we can take the collar off, um, put a magnet on it, um, kill the frequency, and send it back to the manufacturer, and they'll refurbish it, put some new batteries in it, essentially, and send it back to us. About how far can we hear this? I mean, are we talking a mile or two, or how far are we being able to pick up a quail from where we're at? Well, the transmitters we use are about six grams, and we can hear them for about a half of a mile. If you get on a little higher elevation, sometimes you can hear them three quarters of a mile to a mile. Um, but you'd have to be pretty lucky to hear them that far. And about how long does the transmitter last? About 11 months. So basically, uh, it's, it's $200 per bird every time you do that kind of thing. Every 11 months. So it's a pretty expensive proposition, but uh, again, if you think about the technology and the knowledge that we pick up, there's really no other way to get some of this. One last question, Brad. Uh, I know over the last couple of years they've come out with GPS collars for quail, global positioning systems, that would basically take some of the work out of telemetry as we do it, and that we just put that transmitter on and then retrieve it six weeks later and be able to put it on our computer and see where that works. Is, give us a little bit of, you know, is that something that we're looking at in the future, and what are some pros and cons of that? 
Well, I personally think it's a great idea. However, I don't think we're far enough along technologically to really deploy them as far as the expense is, is astronomical. They're probably about $750 a piece. Um, they're relatively heavy because not only do they have the GPS component, they also have a VHF component so that we can find the uh, collar once it's um, finished taking points. About three months is what they're lasting about right now. And uh, so you have a component of expense and also a trade-off of, of time that you can actually follow or monitor that bird. So it's a lot of, like a lot of our technologies today that the battery technology is kind of what's holding up the game? I believe so. Okay. Brad, I know that there's one aspect of radio telemetry that often gets criticized in the literature, especially with smaller animals like quail, and that's radio handicapping. In other words, are we predisposing that animal to higher mortality if we put a radio collar on it? What are your thoughts on that, and what have we seen out here at the research ranch? Well, according to some of our data, there is some overhead cost of, of radio collaring bob whites, and, and usually that costs about 15% um, of their survival. Um, however, there's some research literature from the southeast that suggests that it has absolutely no effect on their birds. And there's also some research from here around the Rolling Plains in Oklahoma that suggests that, yeah, um, it does has, have an impact. And uh, some of our data here on the research ranch also suggests that. So if we're trying to take our survival data, for example, for the absolute truth, we've got to appreciate that we've got some error in there from radio handicapping. But does that impact our, what we've learned as far as nesting quail? Does it have any effect on our, on our basic use of radio telemetry? And that's finding those nests. Uh, as far as a nesting bird, I, I don't believe it's hindering movement all that much. However, uh, they're doing some work right now at Texas Tech to look at how that, that collar is impeding flight movements and if it's slowing down the birds, are raptors and other prey uh, or predators actually keying, on, keying in on those birds that have the collars on them? Right now, I, I don't think we really know um, those answers yet. Just in conclusion, one of the coolest studies that we've ever done out here was we put radio collared birds in the presence of a raptor, a goshawk with a falconer in tow and we'd walk in and flush those quails. Some of them had radios on it, some didn't. And was the falcon able to select by whatever means the radio collared birds? And we, we didn't discern that he could select for them, but what was cool about it was those quail know what kind of threat is after them. And this is a story for another webisode, but when they have a raptor on their tail, they select certain types of cover that will amaze you as a quail hunter.